congratulations then on this this incredible role. I was really absorbed in the film. I think it's fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and it's such a, such a big kind of English history. Um, what drew you to playing this iconic kind of detective? I, 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 I've, 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 I think it's very difficult to be of a certain age in England, not putting you there, obviously, um, but that, and not have been affected by the craze in any way throughout one's life. I, <clears throat> my grandparents <clears throat> were from the East End, they knew the craze, and so I'd heard legions of stories and, and over, the, over the years, and I'd seen all the sort of film adaptations of it and across the ways, and, and I, I certainly didn't think that we needed another one. Um, so when it sort of came my way, I wasn't really um, sort of thinking that it needed to be told. But then when I when I looked at it and the, the producers sort of spoke to me about what, what they were trying to do with Nipper, I started looking at Nipper and, and researching Nipper and reading about Nipper. And then when I read the script, I was actually kind of really fascinated by him and what they'd managed to do. We didn't have the money to recreate 1960s. Um, East End, you know, the, the, that's just not that kind of budget film. Um, and so when I zoomed with Ben Mole, I, who, who directed the film, I was really taken with his idea of kind of creating a world in which this warehouse, this that, 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 that they'd found in the middle of Wales, kind of with all these labyrinthian corridors and alleyways and, and these big turbine rooms and stuff were you know, in ben, Ben's words, like the sort of inner workings of Nippers mind. And I really liked that idea. And so we sort of ran with that. And for me, I, I really sort of, sort of tried to push that idea that, that, and I think it sort of works, I hope it works in film, is that, is that, you know, that, he had failed, Nipper had failed two or three years before because nobody would talk up against the craze. And so when, when he reluctantly the case the second time, um, he, he, he was like, right, if we're going to do this, we have to sort of think in a different way. We have to think, in a, we, have to, we have to really work on, on, on getting somebody to talk because that had been an issue nobody everybody was terrified of them and, and and which is obviously where code of silence comes from and um this this fact that if you grass if you you know snitches get stitches and and you're going to get fucked up if you if you do it so getting his team into a place where they believed that he'd got enough on them that that they were going to go down without them, without the craze then hurting everybody, I think was the, was the key. And I was really fascinated by that aspect of it. And so, I, you know, I, 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 he, he's a very modest man, Nipper, in his book. He didn't, he had no desire to write his autobiography. He kind of, and he was pushed into it. And, and it's a really very dear book because you sort of get a sense of this, how gentle he was, but, he was also a boxer, the craze were boxers, as we know. He was also from a working class background and he was from, uh, you know, he left school with no qualifications. And I think in some version of, I like to think that there was sort of a, a mutual respect from the craze because he came from a sort of similar place that they did. Yeah, it's, it's really interesting you say that because I was going to mention that it's like they're one side two different sides of one coin yeah. where like it flipped and nippers you choose you it. choose your journey don't you it's yeah <clears throat> fate <clears throat> fate plays a massive part in who we become um because you know you literally sometimes in one in, in your life you end up in a fork in the road and you sort of you know i took many wrong turnings when i was a young man <laughs> many young and <laughs> and and, and and I often wonder, like, well, oh, if I hadn't done that, I wonder what, you know, he, he was, he was a very small man. And at that, at the time, you couldn't get, it's, it's quite interesting, actually, because <clears throat> I want to say that 
I want to say that to be in the police, you had to be five foot ten. But to be in the Metropolitan Police, you had to be five foot eight. Oh. <laughs> and, you, and he was from Nottingham. So, so he went down and went to the Metropolitan Police, but he was actually like five foot seven. So he, he was lying all the way from the beginning, like, you know. And, and so that I, I thought that was really interesting as well, because, because, like, he's, he was also sort of dodging and weaving a bit and doing it, doing everything he could to sort of, you know, build himself up. And he, he came from nothing and he ended up running the joint, you know, so yeah. very, very cool man. He's also um, so wildly successful. I think I read that there's only a few cases that he never solved. Yeah. And, and even though he wasn't in charge of the operation, you know, he was he was um, uh, a big fundamental piece in the in the um, uh, Great Train Robbery. Yeah. Um, yeah. And and so, you know, massively respected within within his within his uh, uh, place in the in the in the in the constabulary and, and people were looking up to him. Yeah. And it's so interesting then that somehow in this film, he feels like he's up against everyone in the Met, the craze, the people who, the witnesses, that he's just kind of like this. It keeps this going man. wrong for him, doesn't it? It's funny because yeah. I only watched it a couple of nights ago and I'd forgotten that, you know, there's certain things that don't happen in the way that he's hoping that they're going to happen. And he sort of ends up back at square one and um, he's quite a sanguine fella. He, he kind of he's like, right, I'm not going to be beaten by this, you know. Um, uh, and obviously there, there is dramatic license, but there's kind of historic evidence for all of the little bits and pieces that happen. There's, there's historic evidence for all of it, but we've had to condense it because it's a film. Yeah. You know, you're not telling like a 10 hour series, you're telling a, a 90, 10, 95, like 100 minute version of the story. So you have to pick and choose what, which are the bits important to sort of tell the audience on, as you're chaining the events along, you know. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and it's so fascinating that we, like you mentioned before, there are so many films and like TV series and books about the craze and Nipper. And why do you, it's kind of like Jack the Ripper. I always, I always put those two kind of like figureheads together that we're so yeah. involved and entrenched in these East End figures. Why do you yeah. think we keep going back to the craze? And It's so uh, interesting, isn't it? It's, we, we, we have this sort of generalized idea in, in our society and it's not just England um, of the sort of Robin Hood story, you know, the bad guys doing good by, by you know, they were lovely to their mum and, and, you know, in Australia, Ned Kelly's very similar and, you know, and, and, and in the US, for everybody from Al Capone on and then you've got El Chapo and all of these, all of these characters that have very, they've done some very, very evil things that become heroic because somehow they've bucked the system, you know, somehow they've taken on the system and they've beaten it and we love that don't we i mean i love an underdog story so i so and i also grew up you know my family from my grandparents uh, from the east end i grew up in essex but my grandparents all of them all four grandparents are from the east end and and everybody had stories about the greys and knew them in in you know everybody at a certain age you know knew them i actually i actually went to see my auntie joan who was one of my my nan's best friends. And I went to see her because I knew that she knew the craze. And, and, um, and I, I also knew that my nan and, and granddad knew the craze. So I, asked, I wanted to ask Auntie Joan what she remembered. And um, I hadn't seen Joan for 25 years or something like that. <laughs> and um, and it, was, it was really lovely. And, and she talked about being in a nightclub. It was really funny. She talked about being in, in and that's the first time I've told this story. Um, she was in a restaurant, uh, her husband, Jim, and they, 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 he was very successful, Jim, and uh, totally then, but, you know, he'd done very well. And, and, um, and Joan had got a, like, a fur coat on, 1962 or something, you know. She got a fur coat on, and... and and they'd asked if she wanted to have the, the coat put into the cloak for him at this restaurant. And, and she said, no, I want to keep it with me because it was worth quite a lot of money, you know. So it had been draped over the back of the chair. 
And the craze had come in and sort of everybody sort of nodded and, you know, looked over and they, they had got a big table at the restaurant. And Joan at one point went up to go to the loo and, and then, and, and, at, and at some point they had got, I think, I think it was like a dance club or something. So they got up and danced. And when they'd come back, the coat had gone. <laughs> and, um, and they asked the restaurant for it and, and it said, you know, our coat's gone. And they said, we don't know anything about this. So the next morning, Uncle Jim had said, you know, you've got, to, this needs to be sorted out. This is not right. And sure enough, somebody from that table <laughs> had, had half inched it. And, and finally it, it had been returned like a, a few days later, but in the back of the, in the back of the pink stall, Uncle Jim had had Auntie Jones name embroidered in, wow. in, the, in the back and it had been very very carefully unpicked and <laughs> because they were obviously going to flog it on and, and I just thought that was such a great story like like and it might not have been one of them it might have been one of the boys of course it, of course it's why would the phrase you know but I love the idea that um, everybody's always on the make aren't they everybody's yeah. always trying to like get something it's just like it, it, anything that that would that would lead to a few quid in your pocket you know yeah um, even even a coat on a chair that's an amazing story <laughs> I know and and she said I was really upset because because that embroidery was really beautiful that Jim had done for me anyway, <laughs> and she's like 85 now and, uh but um so everybody has a cray story and and so they, there's this there's there's this this heroic idea of of these people and 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 um and I I, I mean I remember I, I think I sort of grew up not really respecting the police because you always respect the villains and not the <clears throat> not the authority somehow you know so I think it's quite an interesting idea of I think I was must have like subconsciously been attracted to that somehow the idea that we're sort of telling a nipper's story than telling it from a sort of respectful decent human who's who's trying to do the right thing you know yeah yeah and it, it works absolutely well I'm just sorry I'm still like caught on the idea that you should do a sequel and it's about Joan's coat <laughs> <laughs> <You're>... <laughs> So. craze overcoats and yes you know yeah. <laughs> there's a little short film there definitely there is a definitely a little short film there yeah. um so it's really interesting I think my other question is um it's playing opposite Ronan because he plays the both the craze doesn't he do doesn't he do an amazing job he does great job at both of them yeah, yeah. really like that scene when you're talking over the table was so good it's it's really interesting because um there's <sighs> you end up taking a bit of dramatic license to, to tell a story. You have to, you know, otherwise watch a documentary because it's, you know, it's, it's, I, whenever people ask me this, it's like, well, that's not what happened in real life. And I'm like, well, it's not a fucking documentary. It, I'm also not Nipper Reed, you know, and neither is, you know, Tom Hardy, Reggie Pratt. You are watching a piece of fictional narrative, you know, so it, Sometimes you have to take liberties because you've, you've got, only got hundred minutes to tell the story. You know there were there were a few recordings and 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 there was a similarity between the way that Reg, R Ronnie and Reggie spoke. But I really liked um, Ronan's Ronan's differentiation between the two. Uh, it's it's he, he and and when he when he became. Obviously, you have to shoot those things separately, and it, and it was a sort of an hour makeup because there were little little physical things that he had that that were makeup that were slightly different, and and there was a vocal register that he sort of placed them in that was slightly different, which I thought was great, um, and and they became two separate, two very separate characters, and and then once once Ronan came in as one, he would stay as him, he would be him for the time that he was on set which I really enjoy as an actor. I really enjoy that commitment. And, um, and I also really love the technical side of filmmaking. So putting twins on screen, as you can imagine, is quite a difficult thing. Having twins on screen while you're on screen with them is a very difficult thing. 
uh, technically to sort of pull off. And so they're, they're, they're the sort of things that I really enjoy just from a geeky film loving <laughs> point of view, you know? Yeah, absolutely. And just my final question then was about a geeky film loving yes. thing. I quite enjoyed about this film and what you and Ben do together is the inventive scenes where he goes into the crime. Yes. Oh, good. Everything. You like that. Yeah, I really yeah. enjoyed that. It kind of gave it somewhat of a Sherlock feel, but like I quite enjoyed yeah. it. I, yeah. I honestly, that was one of my, one of the things that I was, uh, he sold it up to me on. It's, it, you know, we, <clears throat> we were principally in, in Wales in this warehouse, but we had a couple of times where we, obviously you've got to go to the blind beggar if you're doing it, doing the, the, the prey investigation. So we shot during the second lockdown and we found this really cool old pub. And um, so obviously that's the blind beggar, but you, he said, I want to put you in the blind beggar. I want to put you there sitting, watching it. And almost sort of got a, a pretty natural like um, uh, ability to sort of place himself in, 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 that, in that moment. And, um, and, and likewise, Obviously, we, we go to the apart the, the, the flats that the, 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 the crazy lived in as well. But I love the idea of sort of like, if I was there, what would I have seen? If, if I was the barmaid, what would I have seen that day? If I was, you know, it's almost like a matrix thing of like going around and, and working out, <clears throat> you know. I, I used to love, when I was a student, when I was a drama student, I used to go into pubs and sort of listen to people's conversations and sort of, earwig you know and alan Good bennett used time. to do it on the bus you know <laughs> alan bennett used to write down conversations that people were having in front of him in the bus i used to do the same thing and um so so i yeah thank you for like uh, thank you for sort of appreciating that ben and i looked at different ways of being able to do that and 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 so when we when we're going from the past into the present you're always looking for sort of bridging moments well if I turned and looked to camera at this point, that could flash us back to the present. Or, you know, what about if what about if I walk and 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 I walk from the past into the present? So how would that look? How would we make that camera move work? You know, things like that. I mean, that's just stuff that I I love. It's so good. It's so Thank well you. done, and your performance is really great. And I can't wait for people to see the film. Thank you, Sarah. I appreciate yeah, that. Thank, yeah, thank you so much for talking with me today. I think that's all we've got time for, but I hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Ladies and gentlemen, you're watching Hey You Guys! Hey You Guys, huh? Hey you guys, yeah. Is that from the Goonies? Yeah, indeed, yeah. Nice. Hey!